Hi there, you're very welcome to this episode of Dark Vanishings. I hope you're keeping well wherever you are in the world. Today's episode is about the mysterious disappearance of Stephen Clark. I'd really like to thank Steve, one of the subscribers to the Dark Vanishings channel for this suggestion. Much appreciated, Steve. This is a baffling and intriguing case. So let's get started. On the 28th of December 1992, some 30 years ago, Stephen and his mother Doris would set off from their home in Marskill in Yorkshire in the UK to the nearby Saltburn. It's a 45 minute walk along the beach. When they would reach Saltburn, they would pop into the public toilets. Doris would pop into the ladies and Stephen into the gents. When Doris would re-emerge from the toilets, there was no sign of Stephen. Now, Saltburn Beach is regularly voted the number one beach in the UK. It's a gorgeous, long, sandy beach. And this was a bank holiday weekend. It was also Christmas. So there were lots of visitors uh, at the beach from outside the area, locals as well, and the beach was thronged. So Doris figured that she must have just missed Stephen with all the crowds, etc. And she decided to return home thinking she would probably catch up to him on the way. Doris would never catch up to her son and when she got home he wasn't at home as well. In fact Doris would never see her son again. He has been missing for 30 years. He literally vanished without a trace. In this video I like to put forward some theories as to what I feel happened to Stephen and I'd like to share with you the theory that I think is the most likely. So let's move forward. But first, a little bit about Stephen and his family. Stephen was just 23 years old when he went missing. He had his whole life ahead of him. Here we see him aged two years of age. He was actually born in the UK in 1969, but his parents, Charles and Doris, would emigrate to South Africa, where they would live for 10 years. So Stephen actually spent the bulk of his childhood in South Africa. When Stephen was two years old, he would have a devastating accident. One day when Doris was going to the shops, he somehow managed to get out of the house and he followed her down the street. She had no idea that, uh, you know, Stephen had got out of the house. Next thing, a truck struck Stephen. He ended up in a coma for one month and when he would re-emerge from this coma, he would be left with permanent disabilities. He had a severe limp uh, in one of his legs and one of his arms was also badly damaged. It was pretty much dormant and he seemed to rely on the other arm for the most part. And I will show you evidence of this uh, in this video. Stephen's uh, sister Victoria was born when Stephen was just two years old, uh, around the time of the accident. Um, and eventually Doris and Charles would decide to return to the UK. Now they lived in places like Edinburgh for a while and Surrey, and eventually they would return to the area of Marskill on sea. Um, it was a lovely seaside area, a lovely place to bring up children. Um, they had also been police officers together in the Teesside area, so the location probably had a lot of happy memories for them. When you're reading about the case, you will come across many cruel and unkind comments about Doris in relation to this accident. And I think that they're really unfair. I mean, accidents happen to children, even when parents are utterly devoted, utterly attentive. I mean, you can go to any A&E department up and down the country and you will see it full of children who have gotten into accidents, serious, fatal, non-serious, and they have utterly devoted parents. It doesn't sometimes matter how many child locks you use, um, you know, and I think that somehow that day Stephen managed to get out of the house and the fact that he wanted to follow his mother actually speaks to the love and affection he had for his mother. Um, you know, so uh, I think Doris has come in for a lot of heat and often the heat is put on the mother and she continues to experience a lot of heat. Victoria, uh, Stephen's sister, 
who was born when Stephen was two years old. There's a quote in a BBC News article from her, and I'll show you that article at the end of the video. And she says that her parents did everything they could for her and Stephen growing up to make them happy and that their childhood was, quote, a love filled childhood. Now, I think it would be very hard for uh, Victoria to be so enthused, so enthusiastic. Uh, you know, about the upbringing she had, if she had seen her brother abused or she was abused. I'm inclined to believe her. And we see lots of photographic evidence of, you know, happy family times, including these photos here, Stephen with his mother out and about and having a great time. So here we see Stephen again enjoying more happy times, you know, as he was growing up. And his parents would say that he never let anything bring him down. So here's a photograph of Charles and Doris. I can't even begin to imagine what they've been through over the last 30 years, the anguish of not knowing what happened to their son. Um, and I'm sure that anguish is intensified by the fact that they knew their son had some disabilities and you know, there's an added vulnerability that goes with that. More recently, the police would investigate uh, Doris and Charles in relation to the murder of their son. They dug up their back garden, they inspected their house from top to bottom and more, but they couldn't find any evidence and they didn't move forward with any kind of prosecution. Uh, they basically sort of, you know, stopped investigating the couple. Uh, I do not believe that Doris and Charles murdered their son. I mean, I can't even imagine with all the worry they've been through to then be on top of all that charged with his murder. Um, I mean, it's, you know, heartbreaking. I think that in actual fact, the evidence points to the very contrary. I think that this couple did everything that they could to empower and support their son. Stephen was having some difficulties finding employment. Uh, you know, and he was an independent kind of go-getting kind of guy. And this was a real source of frustration to him. A local society that places uh, people with disabilities in employment placed Stephen. Um, he was thrilled to pieces. I'm actually going to show you a clip of Stephen in his placement. He would actually go on to win Apprentice of the Year and a cash prize of a thousand pounds. Uh, he would receive his award at this very swish ceremony and he would get a lot of media publicity, you know, in the local media, etc. So, um, you know, Stephen was thriving and his parents were always there for him. I feel there are far more plausible theories in relation to Stephen's disappearance. Uh, and I will outline what those are uh, shortly. So first, I'm just going to play you the clip of Stephen. Now, what I would like you to notice is uh, how Stephen uses one arm principally and also he has quite a severe limp as well. Now this is important in terms of his victim profile because a lot of people said you know what could happen Stephen strapping guy six foot one. Well we do know that when uh, people are attacked and they have two you know hands two arms they put up a good fight, they have lots of defensive wounds, but they can still be overpowered. But you can imagine if you've just got one arm, one arm, you know, that is fully functional and you also have a limp that does make you vulnerable in terms of an attack. But I will talk about this um, in more detail shortly. So I'll just play you the clip now. Using the yellow pages and the, the, the business directory. So Stephen had encountered difficulties in relation to securing work. You know, people, you know, employers, should I say, wouldn't give him a chance because of his disabilities. But now Stephen was, you know, working. Uh, he had this placement. He had won Apprentice of the Year. Uh, you know, there was a cash prize as well that, you know, he hadn't claimed it actually prior to his disappearance, but that prize was there. Everything was coming up roses for Stephen. And that's why it is so poignant that Stephen should just suddenly vanish. So I just like to briefly revisit that day uh, just for a couple of minutes. And then I would like to explore the theories as to what I feel may have happened to Stephen. 
So I just want to mention uh, this piece, it's in the mirror, which is a British tabloid about Saltburn Beach. And it says here that in 2021, it was crowned as the winner of the best beach in the UK. And you can see why it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the sandy, you know, beach, sandy, beautiful sandy beach. Um, gorgeous pier in the distance. You know, this is a beautiful beach. The reason I highlight this is because this beach on a bank holiday weekend, Stephen went missing on the 28th of December, would have attracted, you know, thousands of people uh, from outside the region and also locals as well. So, you know, a lot more people milling around uh, also could mean there's a lot more potential that something could have happened to Stephen, maybe by a third party. So it is something to consider. We've got to remember it's also Christmas. It's, it's the 28th of December. You know, people are drinking and, you know, this is something to consider. But I will be talking uh, about uh, various theories in relation to Stephen's disappearance uh, shortly. Now, just to give you an idea of how popular Saltburn Beach is, you can see here in TripAdvisor that it gets four and a half stars out of five. If you look there in the top left hand corner and actually a lady has given a review of the walk that Stephen and Doris did together from Marsk to Saltburn. And she says that it's a lovely family walk that, you know, she and her partner did it with their seven month old baby. And when they got to the end of the pier, they had a drink. So again, you can see it's a popular place to have a drink and unwind. And, and then they turned around and, and she calls it a beautiful place. So something that I do want to mention is that, you know, sometimes I, I read comments uh, or analysis and they say that, you know, was Stephen on the beach at all that day? You know, how did he walk on the beach with his disability? But you can see here there's a family walking there with a seven month old baby, you know, um, Stephen would not have found the beach uh, difficult to walk on at all. So on the day that Stephen disappeared, Charles was going to a football match and Stephen would normally accompany him. But on this day, Charles said that if Stephen wanted to go, he would have to pay for his own ticket. Now, a lot of people said this was awful on the part of Charles. You know, his son was disabled, etc. I think that Charles was coming from a good place. Stephen was now working. He was 23. He was just uh, continuing the good work that he and Doris had done for so many years in terms of developing their son's independence and autonomy. You know, he was basically saying, you know, son, now you can start to pay some of your own expenses. This is part of growing up, etc. I totally get that. It kind of baffles me that people make this out to be, you know, a, a sign that, you know, the parents murdered uh, Stephen. You know, it was a fabrication that Charles went to the match and it was a fabrication that Doris and Stephen went to the beach. They murdered their son and these were excuses that they came up with. Well, I think they would have come up with much better excuses. They could have said there was a row in the house, Stephen stormed off, they never saw him since. Uh, I think, you know, this is not an outlandish scenario that Charles made a point, he stuck to his gun. Stephen didn't want to pay for the ticket to go to the match. He chose instead to go for a walk with his mother uh, and Charles stuck to his guns. Um, and, you know, those are the decisions in parenting sometimes that people make, you know, and I think they had done a really good job in terms of Stephen's independence. He was now working. He had met a woman in his local pub. He liked to go for a few drinks in his local pub, either independently or with his dad. Uh, he loved to go bowling. Stephen was living a really full life. Again, a lot of people have said, you know, could uh, Doris and Charles have just wanted to get rid of him, get him out of the way he was going to be a lifelong burden? I actually think that at the rate Stephen was going, he probably would have ended up moving out quite shortly, maybe on his own or in time, he would have, you know, moved out with a partner. Uh, you know, he was a tall, attractive man. He already had met a woman in his local pub. So I don't, I don't feel that the parents viewed him as being this, you know, burden for life, etc. Uh, you know, so the other thing that I wanted to talk about was the incident at the public toilets where Doris and Stephen became separated. Again, there's been a lot made of this. You know, I, I've often gone to public bathroom facilities, let's say in, you know, a, a cinema or 
in a shopping centre and my friend will say, I'll see you outside. I get outside. That person's not there. They've sort of wandered off and we have to catch up to each other. Um, you know, it happens. Pe you know, people's wires get crossed. They just miss each other. Um, you know, and one may move off in an opposite direction, not expecting that the other one is going to vanish without a trace for 30 years. The odds of that happening. I think that on that day, um, Doris figured she just messed him and, you know, he wasn't too far away. Uh, you know, he was 23 years old. He was working now. She, she probably just made that split second judgment that it would be OK. And I think it's also hard for people on the outside looking in to maybe understand her fear of calling his name into the gents toilets or, you know, getting a gentleman's check. Was he there? You know, I'm sure there were many times when Doris uh, was intrusive in, in Stephen's mind, you know, double checking on him and etc. And he, he didn't like it. And we do know that, you know, he wasn't in a good mood that day uh, because of the ticket. So perhaps both sides were a little bit weary. There'd been a little bit of a tiff. Um, Stephen might have got out of the toilet facilities and thought, she's not here. I'll head on home. Saw that he was not in a good mood. Equally, Doris waited for a while and she just made that split second decision she could have been weary you know these people are human beings uh, they get tired they have tiffs even more so when there's a person with a disability in a household and uh you know I, I i think it was just one of those things where they got separated they expected to catch up uh and you know 99.99 percent of cases you would catch up and it was just one of those awful sort of you know freak happenings if you like that Stephen just vanished. And, you know, you could argue that perhaps in a small way, the TIFF, you know, could have contributed to that. I always felt that Charles and Doris looked a little guilty, not in terms of having murdered their son or having been bad parents, but maybe they, they kind of figured, gosh, you know, maybe that little TIFF just sort of, you know, rocked the apple cart a little bit. Um, you know, when people are emotional, sometimes dangerous things can happen and you know Steve got separated from his mother at the beach there were a lot of visitors to the beach that weekend uh you know but you know and how many households are there tiffs and you know little tiffs and people are going about their 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 daily lives going to work socializing and in the majority of cases those tiffs have absolutely no impact so it's 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 not a reflection because they had a tiff that you know Stephen was a bad son or they were bad parents and it's certainly not a reflection that they were murderers so i'd just like to talk about some of the sightings of Stephen after he disappeared so one of the first ones was on the 30th of december a woman that actually knew the family through the bowling alley Stephen loved to go bowling saw Stephen exiting the beach with a man who appeared to be about 50, maybe 60 years of age. He had sort of longish, kind of whitish grey hair, slightly bulging and uh, glasses. Um, now, the police actually went to her apartment because she said that she had seen the sighting from her apartment. But when they got to her apartment, she didn't actually have a clear view of the beach. So they wondered how credible this sighting actually was. Now, the next sighting came 17 days after Stephen disappeared. A man called Stan, who knew the family through uh, the pub that they liked to drink in, uh, he said that he had a chat with uh, Stephen in red car. He actually told his wife when he got back to her, he was in the town that day, I was just chatting to young Stephen. Now, both Stan and his wife would say that they didn't know that Stephen was missing. Now, I found this a little strange because it would have been all over the local news media, etc. So, you know, that was a little surprising. They reported the sighting to the police in any event. But later down the line, Stan would change his statement. He said that he just saw Stephen in the distance. He thought just by the way this this man walked and he only saw the back of who he thought, you know, that it was Stephen. So to my mind, both of these sightings have the potential to be what I would call empathetic or sympathetic sightings. So, you know, they know the family is going through hell. They know the family 
you know, through the bowling alley, through the pub. They know the family is going through hell, a lot of heightened emotions, and they think they see Stephen and they're just dying to go back and give this nugget of hope to the family. The other, you know, factor that we have to consider is that some sightings can also be diversionary. They're planted to detract police away from the actual truth. So somebody could say some, they saw somebody 10 days after they disappear, but they know already that that person is dead. Now, I'm not in any way suggesting that Stan uh, was doing this, but just, you know, hypothetically and theoretically, that can also happen. I think that in both of these instances, they these were most likely sympathetic sightings. The only thing is, I have to say, the one on the 30th of December, something about it slightly rings true to me. Uh, I, I I will come back to this, but, you know, we do have to go on what the police, uh, you know, conjectures and, and they felt that, you know, this might not be a reliable sighting because this lady didn't have a good view of the beach. Now, decades later, and just in the last few years, uh, somebody would come along to say that they had seen Stephen on the 28th of December 1992 between 3 and 4 p.m. Now, the police believe that this is a credible sighting and this would certainly back up or substantiate Doris's point that most likely Stephen had headed home. So her motherly instinct was right on that one. Uh, you couldn't have expected that having almost reached home, he would vanish at that point. Uh, and the question is, what did happen to him after this point? The other question I have is, you know, why do some people take so long, often decades, to come forward with such critical pieces of information? I guess some people don't want to get involved in a case. And then perhaps when they saw that, you know, Doris and Charles were under investigation for murder and their garden was being dug up, they kind of thought, gosh, I had better share this detail. This could be important. So uh, it would appear the police are more confident about this sighting that Stephen was almost home. And, and the great mystery now is, you know, what happened to him, you know, at this point? In 1997, the police would receive an anonymous letter stating that the most uh, likely uh, killers of Stephen were in fact his parents. Now, uh, you know, this was considered at the time possibly to be a credible piece of uh, information. But in fact, in recent years, the letter writer would actually come forward to say that, you know, the entire premise that Charles and Doris could have murdered Stephen was just based purely on a hunch. So essentially, this letter was actually useless. So what did happen to Stephen? Well, to my mind, there's only five possibilities. So let's look at those. Number one, Stephen was murdered by his parents. Now, even though the police you know, are not suspicious of uh, Charles and Doris now, in the minds of the public, this remains the number one theory. And I'd like to discuss with you now why I feel, you know, this isn't a runner actually as a theory in relation to his disappearance. Uh, number two, Stephen was harmed by a third party. Number three, Stephen committed suicide. Number four, Stephen's death was accidental. Or number five, Stephen started a new life. So let's look at the first theory. Was Stephen murdered by his parents? Well, one of the reasons why people believe that Stephen was murdered by his parents is because it is recognised that, you know, raising children is stressful, but raising children who have disabilities is doubly stressful. Um, this is a very interesting working paper in Families and Societies, and it looks at the impact of having a disabled child in a family. And it says that basically it, it can result in a lot of stressors like marriage breakup, uh, mental and physical uh, health problems, uh, economic difficulties, etc. So in the minds, I think, of the public, people were thinking, you know, were they exhausted? Had they just had enough? Perhaps the argument over the ticket was, you know, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back. Well, let's look at some of these factors. You know, Charles and Doris 
are, are still married and they're in their early 80s. Um, if you see them in interviews, for example, this morning interview, and there's also a documentary on ITV uh, about the disappearance of Stephen Clark. I'll talk about it shortly. And they are a very happily married couple. They are very demonstrative, very tactile. They are very supportive of one another. Uh, so this is a strong marriage. Um, they are in top physical and mental health. Even with all that has gone on, you can see that, you know, these are resilient people. I mean, they were police officers before, so you do need some resilience for that. Um, and also when you see their lovely home in Mars on Sea, they seem to be very financially comfortable. I don't believe that they were under this huge, enormous stress caring for their son. Um, you know, uh, for the main part, even though Stephen did have some serious challenges, you know, he didn't have the use of one arm. He had a severe limp. There are far more uh, disabled children out there. I think that they were coping really well. I'm sure they had the odd day like the day of the 28th of December with their tiffs and, you know, um, they had lots of days like that. But even in families where there aren't disabilities, you can have days like that. Uh, but I personally feel that, you know, even just looking at this research, uh, you could see that Doris and Charles were coping very well. So this is a very interesting piece and it's uh, called Making Things Easier at Home and it's on scope.org.uk and it's basically advice, uh, this particular page, for parents of children with disabilities and it says, and I quote, being a, child, being a parent, apologies, is hard. Looking after a child with additional needs means that you have even less time and energy at home. This can uh, cause some parents to reach a crisis point. And I think the inference in relation to Stephen's disappearance is that somehow, uh, you know, Charles and Doris, they were worn out, they reached a crisis point. But again, for reasons that I've just discussed, um, you know, they were in good health, physically, mentally, they had, their finances were good. Um, you know, I, I feel they were coping very well. I, I don't think they were at a uh, crisis point. So I think that that actually undermines the the premise that, you know, they were at breaking point, they snapped and, and therefore they, you know, murdered their son. Uh, I just don't see the evidence of marriage breakup, financial difficulties, health stressors. Uh, of course, they had difficult days. That day was probably a difficult day, but I, I don't think they were, you know, anywhere near that kind of crisis point where somebody could snap and even the majority of people who do reach that crisis point they reach out for support they don't snap i i just don't think they're at the point where they would have killed their son so one of the arguments that people put forward to sort of indicate that doris and charles killed stephen is that stephen didn't take his glasses and his wallet to the beach that day and people were kind of going you know what person steps out without their wallet or their glasses well if you look in the bottom right hand corner i've put together a collage of photos um, uh, Stephen has no glasses. He's at the beach and he has no glasses. We can see him in the top left hand corner. He looks as if he might be going to a wedding or going, you know, to a social occasion. He has no glasses. By contrast, when he's working, you can see in the top right hand corner and um, in his school uniform in the bottom left hand corner, he has on his glasses. So I suspect that Stephen didn't need glasses unless he was doing quite, you know, sort of close up work. Uh, and he didn't wear them socially, that, that's my guess. Uh, in relation to his wallet, well, we know that he didn't like to spend money. Uh, he probably figured his mother had her wallet with her. Uh, I, I honestly don't think there's much more to it than that. Now, um, I asked some of my friends, some of my friends are big walkers, and they love to go out walking. Do you take your wallet with you? And they were like, no because, you know, I don't want to stop at a shop and buy loads of sweets on the way back. I'm trying to get fit, um, you know, or I'm going to an area, it's a big park, there isn't a shop nearby or, uh, you know, so again, I just don't think it's that unusual that he didn't take a wallet. Something else that I wanted to mention as well is that many people, you know, have said, why didn't somebody see Doris and Stephen on the beach that day, even around the, you know, toilet area, the public toilet area? or you know just walking along the beach well i have to say you know i was in a shopping center the other day and it was thronged and there were able-bodied people disabled people you know and i couldn't tell you what one of 
you know, or anybody in that shopping centre looked like. I can't remember one face apart from the face of my friend. Um, you know, and I, I just wouldn't recall it. There was so many, you know, throngs of people. So I, I guess on that day, on a busy beach, it would have been easy for Doris to uh, uh, and Stephen to have avoided, you know, for people not to have noticed them. You know, maybe if Stephen had been on a wheelchair in the beach, you know, uh, you know, that might have been different. So uh, I, I think that that also explains why why nobody saw them. It was just a really busy day. So in this ITV documentary, Charles and Doris are being investigated by the police for the murder of their son. Now, this just took place, uh, you know, in the last few years. Uh, Charles and Doris, you know, are in their 80s. Uh, and Mark William Thomas, a renowned investigator uh, in the police force turned investigative journalist, is actually also involved in the programme. Uh, you know, he's renowned for his investigative abilities. And he concludes by the end of the documentary that there is absolutely no evidence to support this claim that Doris and Charles murdered their son and equally the police also reached this conclusion. I mean, you know, they dug up the back garden, they combed over the house, uh, you know, they explored all avenues um, and, you know, nothing uh, turned up that would uh, support uh, this claim, you know, that they murdered their own son. So was Stephen harmed by a third party? So these are statistics in relation to crimes in the Saltburn, Marsk, uh, Marsk by the Sea, uh, Red Car area, etc. And you can see here that the dominant form of crime is violent and uh, sexual offences. So violent attacks on people and sexual offences. The next one is antisocial behaviour. So, you know, it's not inconceivable that, you know, sometimes around that beach area, you know, antisocial behaviour is taking place, sexual and violent crimes are taking place and Stephen could potentially have just been in the wrong place, um, you know, at the wrong time on that day. Well, to my mind, given the weekend that was in it, the 28th of December, bank holiday weekend, uh, the beach was, you know, thronged with people coming from outside the region, locals, etc. Christmas period, people drinking. I think that there's an elevated risk of uh, Stephen having been uh, attacked by a third party. And um, this is very interesting. It's actually uh, from victimsupport.org.uk. And it says that disabled people are at increased risk of violent crime. The victim support research uh, reveals. And it says, and I quote, people with a limiting disability or illness are almost three and a half times more likely to suffer serious violence. And this is analysis from this charity, Victim Support. And they did this detailed analysis drawing on the crime survey for England and Wales. So, um, you know, that's a, a very compelling statistic. People with disabilities almost three uh, and a half times more likely to be the victim of a violent crime. Now, just out of curiosity, I just popped in disabled man uh, attacked UK into the Google search engine. Um, and you can see there's so many stories. Police launch appeal in hunt for gang of youths that attacked a man in a wheelchair. Uh, another one, uh, you know, disabled man punched repeatedly in Gloucester, completely unprovoked. Um, and, and the attacks and the stories just go on and on and on. You couldn't believe the range um, and the extent of them. And also, uh, in, in some instances, these attacks ended up being fatal. Um, it could be gang of youth. It could be maybe one or two people working together. Um, it, you know, there were all, all sorts of permutations. So these crimes are, you know, taking place today. If they are taking place today, they were taking place back in 1992. We've got to remember the statistics that I mentioned about violent crime uh, and antisocial behaviour. That's the kind of predominant crime in that sort of salt burn Marsk on sea areas. So it's not outside the bound of possibilities that uh, Stephen, you know, was attacked uh, in this manner because of his disability.
which is really tragic. So this is a piece in unitedresponse.org.uk in October 2022, and it describes disability hate crimes as rising to record levels. So if disability hate crimes, you know, are a phenomenon, you can be sure that, you know, they were very prevalent also back in 1992. And just to give you an idea of how prevalent this kind of crime is, in the same piece, it says that there were more than 11,000 disability hate crimes, uh, 11,224 to be exact, reported to police between April 2021 and March 2022. This is a 25% increase on the previous year. Just 1% of these cases resulted in a charge or a CPS referral. So effectively what this says to me is that this kind of you know, hate crime, this disability, uh, hate crime, you know, people who are, you know, struggling with disabilities and, you know, who have enough challenges as is, you know, uh, are subject to, uh, you know, vicious attacks. Some, some are fatal. And, you know, there's virtually no prosecution of this crime. So who's to say that this didn't also happen to Stephen? He was attacked by a gang of youths or maybe one or two people or you know, uh, and it was as a result of his disability. And they also have uh, escaped detection and prosecution. Something else that we have to consider is that Stephen could have potentially been killed for his prize money. Uh, maybe it was a robbery that went wrong. Christmas time is a time when people don't have a lot of money. Um, they wouldn't have realised that he hadn't yet collected his winnings. And um, that could have also been uh, an added motivation. He could have been lured somewhere. And then, you know, like hand over your money, he didn't have it. And, uh, you know, something like that could have also played out. Now, this is a piece in gazette.co.uk. And it says that Teesside has the highest rate of sex offenders in the UK. It says there's a higher rate of sex offenders on Teesside than anywhere else in the country. Disturbing new figures have revealed this is the equivalent of one sex offender for every 605 people who live in our region. Um, so when I was reading this, I actually really felt quite sorry for the people of Yorkshire because I've been to Yorkshire several times. They are the warmest, sweetest, most welcoming people. And to read a piece like that, you know, it's not a reflection of the majority of people who live there. I suppose every you know county will have some sort of statistic attached to it, whether it's the largest amount of, you know, uh, car theft or, you know, but this is something that does need to be considered in terms of um, Stephen's disappearance. Could he have fallen prey to a, a sexual offender? And we've got to remember, we've just seen the statistics there about sexual um, offences in the Marsk and Saltburn and Redcar, etc. areas. So it is not outside the bounds of possibility. So this is a map. And you'll just see in the top right hand corner where the black arrow is, that's Saltburn on sea. And that whole area around there is Teesside. You know, so you can see the proximity. This is, you know, the Teesside area. And this is where these, you know, predators are living. Now, we've got to remember the piece that I just showed you about uh, sex offenders in Teesside is a recent piece. Uh, but I'm sure in 1992, you know, there was probably quite a high prevalence then as well. So this leads me to the subject of Jimmy Savile. Now, I'm not saying that Jimmy Savile abducted or, you know, murdered uh, Stephen, but um, Jimmy has turned out to be uh, one of the most prolific sexual offenders in the UK. He has since passed away, as we know. Uh, for those of you who might not know who Jimmy Savile was, he was a huge figure in the world of entertainment. He had uh, TV shows on Saturday night, etc. He was also a big figure in radio. Um, his Saturday night shows would uh, draw viewerships of 17 million people. I mean, incredible. You know, he was a household name. Uh, there were whispers in entertainment circles during his lifetime, towards the end of his lifetime, that he had perpetuated sexual abuse against uh, children for the most part, but also adults. Um, and after he passed away, uh, the extent of this uh, activity and the depravity of it, the full 
depravity of it came to light. And actually, the person who broke the full uh, depravity of it, coincidentally, is Mark William Thomas, the investigative journalist that I just mentioned in relation to the ITV documentary about the disappearance of Stephen. So this is one of the reasons that, uh, you know, uh, Mark has become so uh, renowned. So this is a piece actually in gazette.co.uk, which talks about Jimmy Savile's links to Saltburn. Um, there is a documentary on Netflix called, uh, I think it's Jimmy Savile, A British Horror Story. And uh, I did watch it and it is very tough viewing. I, I wouldn't recommend it to everybody. It's not for the faint hearted. It's just, again, we just see how much, you know, of a predator he was. Now, the reason I bring this up is I'm not saying that, you know, he was in the area on that day, even though he loved the area. Um, I'm just saying that, you know, this is to give you an idea of what some of these sexual offenders, and we know from the piece that I just read out that Teesside, uh, you know, tends to have quite a high level more recently, it's the highest level, uh, you know, of sexual offenders. But it says in this piece that Savile had been a well-documented fan of Saltburn since his childhood and even put his success down to the seaside town. The Jim will fix it star, that was a programme that he used to host, said it was where he got his first taste of, quote, the good life. Uh, and he described it as being a magical place. Savile's aunt had married a man from Middlesbrough firm of stockbrokers who um, had lived in, you know, a large house overlooking the sea. As a child, he visited regularly and enjoyed holidays um, in the area with his cousins, uh, praising the house, its views and how it gave him the ambition to forge ahead with his career. Uh, so something that does strike me is the first sighting of Stephen on the 30th of December, just the description of it sort of a man who could potentially be balding, though Jimmy's not balding, but he had quite a thin uh, sort of patch of hair on the top of his head. Most of his hair was around the sides of his head, uh, the glasses. He could wear quite strange attire, long coats as well. You know, for a moment you kind of think, gosh, could that have been Jimmy Savile? Um, and that might have explained why Stephen could have been lured away so easily. But as I said, I'm I'm not making that accusation. I I just merely want to bring uh, Jimmy Savile up just to show you that you know a lot of sexual offenders in Teesside, and um, here's one who is possibly one of the most depraved uh, sexual offenders you know that has come to light in recent history, uh, and uh, you know he had links to the area, so. You know, it's it's conceivable that uh, Stephen could have been targeted by a sexual offender. So this piece in the Northern Echo.co.uk describes how a man called John Gibbon um, of Redcar, remember now Redcar was the last place that Stephen was uh, cited by Stan, uh, if, if that sighting is credible. He says that when he was only nine years old, he was lured into a Rolls Royce uh, by Jimmy and he was sexually abused. And this man was actually one of the first to come forward and alert the uh, authorities that he had been sexually abused. Um, so yeah, just an interesting connection there. Uh, the abuse didn't actually take place in Redcar, it was in South End, but you know, uh, Jimmy was a regular visitor to uh, the red car, uh, salt burn area, etc. As I said, I'm not saying that he was linked to Stephen's disappearance, but I'm just trying to give you a flavour uh, that, you know, some sexual predators, they will abuse boys and girls. Uh, Jimmy Savile was also known to abuse um, adults. He also abused disabled children. Uh, you know, the documentary on Netflix exposes all of that. Um, he also abused adults, uh, as I said. So, you know, this will give you an idea of, you know, how depraved some some uh, offenders can be. So here we see that the Cleveland police are investigating 20 to 30 historic child sexual abuse cases. Now, the Cleveland police are also investigating 
Stephen's disappearance. Uh, they're doing this, it says, in light of, and I quote, high profile sexual abuse cases, including those of celebrities such as Rolf Harris, Stuart Hall and Jimmy Savile. And again, I'm not saying that Jimmy Savile uh, abducted and murdered um, Stephen, but I'm just giving you an idea of the range and prevalence of sexual offenders. We know that Teesside has the highest rate in the country. Currently, I'm sure back in 1992, uh, the levels were high as well. And, you know, some were actually household names, you know, uh, entertainers. Uh, Jimmy Savile had links to Saltburn uh, in his youth, in his life. So, but again, I, I think that, that would be a real coincidence for him to be in the area on that day. But we do have to bear in mind a high prevalence of sexual offenders. They are attracted to beaches. Uh, it's not inconceivable that uh, Stephen could have been, you know, in the wrong place at the wrong time that day. Uh, and it was spotted, maybe a sexual offender loitering by the toilets, spotted, um, you know, Stephen and, and followed him. So we have to remember that sex offenders are very drawn to beaches. Uh, you know, people tend to associate them as loitering around schools, etc. But they do also target parks and beaches. And I actually did a Google search about sexual offenders and beaches and all these uh, uh, pieces came up about, um, you know, counties in in America trying to ban sex offenders from beaches. They like beaches because, you know, there are throngs of people. Sometimes people get separated from each other, children from parents. We also saw that Stephen got separated from his mother. Uh, in the summertime, people are wearing very little clothing. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, a predator's paradise, um, you know. So um, they often like to hang around toilet facilities. And, you know, we've got to remember that Doris never saw Stephen come out of the toilet facilities. Maybe he was lured away by, you know, a man, etc. while, uh, you know, she was still in the toilet. So, I mean, that is a possibility. So, um, yeah, this is the reality. Uh, there could have been a predator that day. Uh, so Stephen gets, you know, separated from his mother and, and followed him, uh, you know, and and you know, eventually overpowered him, maybe lured him to somewhere quieter. So the next possibility is, did Stephen commit suicide? In this piece by the Daily Echo, a police officer talks a distressed man down from the cliffs in Saltburn. And the piece actually describes the cliffs as being, quote, a suicide black spot. So could Stephen have gone to the cliffs with the aim of committing suicide? He was fed up that day because of the ticket issue and maybe just generally because of his disabilities. Um, now, the Coast Guard is actually interviewed in that ITV documentary about Stephen's disappearance. And he says that most likely Stephen's body would have been found at the base of the cliffs, that the majority of bodies are found at the base. Um, now, the other possibility, I've seen uh, people on YouTube, um, you know, and Reddit, etc., speculating about this, could Stephen have waded out into the water? Well, with the issues, you know, around his limp and his arm, I don't think that he would have got too far. And if he had managed to commit suicide, his body probably would have washed back to the shore. The most important factor, however, is that I don't feel that Stephen was suicidal. You know, he was enjoying life. He loved to go bowling. He loved to go for a few drinks. He was working. He'd met a woman. He had everything to live for. This is a piece on Science Direct, which talks about people with disabilities having uh, a risk of suicidality or, or wanting to commit suicide that is four times greater than a person without a disability. And it makes sense, you know, because depending on your disability, you could be isolated. Maybe it's hard to meet people. Uh, you know, so depression can sometimes go hand in hand with disability. But again, on this occasion, I think that, you know, uh, Stephen was well supported by his family. He had a lot of activities outside of the home, his bowling, etc. Um, I, I, I just don't feel that suicide is, you know, high up the list uh, in terms of Stephen's disappearance. So did Stephen die accidentally? 
So here's a story in the Guardian newspaper about two boys that were sort of having fun near the edge of the cliffs at Saltburn, mucking around and the next thing they fell over and they actually died. So a really tragic accident. I know that Charles was concerned and he says this in the ITV documentary that perhaps after Stephen got separated from Doris, he went off exploring and maybe he had crawled into a crevice, didn't get back out due to his disability and the tide came in. And it actually shows in the ITV documentary about Stephen's disappearance, a photograph of a tall teenage Stephen, uh, you know, squished into this crevice in a cliff that is about a quarter his size. So, you know, this was a very real worry for Charles. But I think the fact that Stephen was sighted between three and four uh, near his home in Marskill would suggest that on that day he didn't go exploring. This is a very interesting piece about disabilities and alcoholism and the link between alcohol intake and disabilities in that sometimes it can be higher than normal. Uh, people with disabilities face a lot of challenges. Alcohol can be a very soothing uh, mechanism. Also, it can help in terms of socialising with other people and help to ease loneliness, etc. So it's not too hard to understand how it could become a crutch for somebody with a disability. Now, Stephen enjoyed a few drinks. In fact, he had had a few clashes with his father, having come home drunk, etc. a few nights. Um, and again, people have made a lot of this, you know, did this mean that Charles murdered his son? I mean, how many young adults come home drunk up and down the length and breadth of the country and have arguments with their parents? It doesn't make their parents, you know, killers. Um, this is just all part of growing up. But I did think that when Stephen was near to home that day, um, you know, did somebody ask him for drinks? I'm not saying that Stephen was an alcoholic, not at all. He enjoyed a few drinks, but I am just wondering, could alcohol have played a role in his disappearance? Maybe as he neared home, it was Christmas, maybe a neighbour or an acquaintance or peers asked him around to the house for drinks or to a party. He drank too much uh, and he ended up dying an accidental death. And this was, um, you know, covered up. I think if Stephen died an accidental death, I think alcohol could have been the mechanism involved in this. I did wonder could Stephen have started a new life but when I actually looked into you know people with disabilities turning up 20-30 years uh, after they've disappeared it was very rare and I guess it's difficult enough to start a new life when you are able-bodied etc but if you do need support services and you aren't mobile starting a new life is doubly difficult my feeling is is that Stephen didn't start a new life it's the theory that I I would love to see happen because it would mean that Stephen is still out there and so if he did turn up out there it, it would be wonderful it's certainly not outside the bounds of possibility uh, and it's something to consider you know, in terms of his disappearance. But now I'm actually going to put in order uh, the theories that I think are, are the most likely. So I'm going to put in order the theories as I feel, you know, uh, they are in terms of, you know, a most likely cause of Stephen's disappearance. So for me, I think there is a very strong possibility that Stephen could have been harmed in a third party attack, either an attack because of his disability or people thought he had money because it was splashed across the news media that he had won money, uh, or it could have been a sexual predator. And, and I think that, you know, is a very strong contender. I think number two, Stephen could potentially have died of an accident relating to alcohol. Um, not so much an accident like, you know, falling off a cliff or something like that, but I, I do think that that kind of accidental death due to, you know, an excessive amount of drinking, you know, he could have been invited somewhere, they plied him a drink, or, you know, he was happily drinking away himself and he, he just took in too much. Um, Stephen committed suicide. Uh, well, this one I don't buy so much. I, I, I think that Stephen had everything to live for, but certainly looking at the statistics, people with disabilities can have suicidal thoughts to a much uh, far greater extent than people without disabilities. Then the Stephen started a new life. I think this would have been pretty difficult. They're not impossible. Um, I wouldn't totally close the door on it, but I, I think it would involve 
a lot of paperwork, uh, maybe tapping into sports, etc. I think he had all that going on where he was living. And finally, Stephen was murdered by his parents. Uh, to me, this is the, you know, the least likely of all of the uh, theories. So that's my feeling, number one and number two. And, you know, maybe the police could go back and look at who were the key youth offenders in the area at that time, the key sexual predators in the area at that time. Um, you know, that that could be a possibility. And even in terms of Stephen dying an accidental death, you know, lots of interviews with neighbours in the vicinity that might have been aware of a party that went on, etc. Perhaps uh, that that could help also. So here we see on the BBC News website on the uh, 22nd I beg your pardon, 28th of December, exactly 30 years, it's 2022 piece after Stephen went missing, a renewed plea by the police. It also says that the family have joined the Missing People charity. Uh, so that's really good. They have never given up the family. They've been incredible. Um, and this piece actually also contains that quote by Victoria. Do check it out. I've put the URL there. Uh, she's the one who quoted about, you know, her parents providing them with an idyllic uh, childhood. Here is a profile circulated by the police in relation to Stephen's disappearance. Stephen was a positive and inspiring guy. He was just on the cusp of having all his dreams come true. If you have any information in relation to Stephen, no matter how insignificant, please do uh, relay it back to the Cleveland or Middlesbrough police or just go up to any police officer. You can see the details here. Uh, you just don't know how this may in fact have significance. I really do hope that Stephen's parents now in their 80s get the peace of mind that they deserve. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Please do like, comment or subscribe. It means the absolute world to me. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Dark Vanishings. Do take care and all the very best.